Welcome to the overview of child development, brought to you by allceus.com. Child development is a change that occurs over time, which generally follows an orderly pattern moving toward greater complexity, and it enhances the survival of the organism as well as the species. We break child development down into several distinct periods. The prenatal period from conception to birth, infancy and toddlerhood, early childhood, which is two to six years old, your preschool age, middle childhood, six to 12, and adolescence, 12 to 19 years old. Development is described in three domains, but growth in one domain influence the other domains. For example, growth in the physical domain will impact the social emotional domain and to a certain extent the cognitive. Physical changes include body size and proportions, appearance, physical brain development, motor coordination, perception capacities, and physical health. Cognitive domain includes all thought processes, intellectual abilities, including attention and memory, problem solving, creativity, and everyday knowledge. Social emotional includes self-esteem, sexual and personal identity, moral reasoning, understanding and interpreting the expression of emotions, and self-regulation -regula and temperament. So when we talk about child development, we generally talk in terms of theories. A theory is an orderly set of ideas that describe, explain, and predict behavior. They're important in order to give meanings to what we observe and act as a basis for action in order to help us find ways to improve the lives and education of children and people in our society. Child development theory started a long time ago. In the next few slides, we're going to look at some of the most important people in the development of the theories of child development. During the medieval period, children were seen as little adults. Childhood was not a unique phase and were usually only cared for until they could begin caring for themselves around seven years old. Children were treated as adults. They wore adult clothing. They worked adult jobs. They could be married or were even made into royalty as young children. In the 16th century, Puritan religion influenced how children were viewed. Unfortunately, at that point, they believed that all children were born evil and must be civilized. The goal emerged to raise children effectively, and special books were designed for children. So if we think about it, we can hypothesize that in the pre-Reformation period, the children were treated as little adults, their needs were not met, and they probably tended to act out because they didn't learn ways to communicate their feelings and their needs and all those things. So in the 16th century, we have these children that are acting out and, in a sense, perceived as being evil and must be civilized. In the 17th century, the Age of Enlightenment believed that children children were born as clean slates, the tabula rasa theory. They develop in response to nurturing and John Locke proposed the forerunner to behaviorism. In the 18th century, the age of reason, Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, believed that children were noble savages, born with an innate sense of morality and the timing of growth should not be interfered with. He used the ideas of stages of development and postulated the forerunners to maturationist beliefs. Now you can see we've gone from little adults to evil to blank slates to not complete blank slates. They have an innate sense of morality, but we need to nurture them and the timing and, and not interfere with their growth and development. In the 19th century, in the Industrial Revolution, Charles Darwin emerged. His theory of natural selection and survival of the fittest became very popular and very controversial. 
He made parallels between human prenatal growth and other animals and was the forerunner of pathology. Finally, the 20th century, theories about children's development expanded around the world. The child was seen as a worthy of special attention and laws were actually passed to protect children. The psychoanalytical theories were some of the first to hit the map. The beliefs of the psychoanalytical theory focused on the formation of personality. According to this approach, children move through various stages confronting conflicts between biological drives, or the id, and social expectations, or the ego. Sigmund Freud presented his psychosexual theory. The unfortunate problem with this one was it was based on his therapy with troubled adults. He emphasized that a child's personality is formed by the ways his parents managed his sexual and aggressive drives and introduced the concept of, de of defense mechanisms such as sublimation, identification, reaction formation. Now I will stop here because I do think that a certain amount of what Freud had to say really can be useful if you can put aside biases that you may have against Freud. Um, the concept of defense mechanisms and how we react in certain situations. A lot of that is socially prescribed, such as sublimation, taking an unacceptable urge and putting it into something that would be acceptable. So instead of acting out sexually or violently, maybe someone turns it into going out and, and playing, going on a hard run or playing a game or painting or whatever it is they use to get those urges out in a socially acceptable way. Um, many people use defense mechanisms as a stopgap until they have a chance to get in a situation where it's more appropriate to deal with the emotions. Um, it's not always appropriate to act as soon as we feel something. Sometimes we have to table that and push it down for a while, uh, rationalize what's going on, maybe dissociate even a little bit until we can get to a place where we can confront that emotion in an appropriate way. Eric Erickson expanded on Freud's theories and believed that development is lifelong. At each stage, the child acquires his attitudes and skills resulting from the successful negotiation of a particular psychological conflict. He said that the birth to one-year-old is developing trust versus mistrust. When I cry, can I rely on you to meet my needs? When I'm scared, can I rely on you to comfort me? Ages one to three, the child is developing autonomy versus shame and doubt. If I venture out, if I try things on my own, am I going to be punished or are you going to support me? And are you going to be there when I return? Are you going to be a safe haven for me to return to? Three to six, initiative versus guilt, builds on that autonomy versus shame and doubt. The child now believes that, okay, it's okay for me to try things on my own. If I take initiative, is it going to be re rewarded and supported? Or am I told to do as I am told and otherwise children are to be seen and not heard? Industry versus inferiority is your elementary age in which children start trying out new things and they need to be able to develop a sense of confidence in what they do otherwise they start to feel inferior. Not everybody is going to be good at everything but every child needs to have something that they feel good at, something in which they feel confident. Then in adolescence we move into identity versus identity confusion. Who am I? What do I stand for? Intimacy versus isolation is your young adulthood. This is when you're looking for your potential life partner, starting your family, if that's what you choose to do. Gener generativity versus stagnation is your middle adulthood. This is when you're working on your career. You're really developing who you are and you're making your mark. So this is what you're going to remember, be remembered by. Are you going to generate? Are you going to produce? Are you going to contribute 
or are you just going to remain stagnant? And then finally, integrity versus despair is when people start looking back over their life and they realize that ah, I really didn't do much or I did what I did and what I wanted to do and I accomplished a lot in my life. Behavioral and social learning theories believe that the importance of the environment and nurturing in the growth of a child is imperative to their development. Behaviorism actually developed as a response to psychoanalytic theories. Behaviorists rely on what is observable and measurable. All that stuff that goes on inside the head is not something that they're concerned with. Um, behaviorism wanted tangible, observable explanations for what was going on and became the dominant view from the 1920s to the 1960s. It started out with Watson and B.F. Skinner and Pavlov, of course. Pavlov conditioned a dog to salivate when a bell was rung. Started out by pairing the, the bell being rung with a stake. Then eventually just the bell being rung, the dog came to anticipate the stake and would start salivating. They both researched classical conditioning um, the concept of reinforcement versus punishment. Reinforcement increases the likelihood that something's going to happen. Now it can be positive or negative. Positive reinforcement is giving a reward for doing something positive. Negative reinforcement is taking away something unpleasant. For example, if you finish your main course, I won't make you eat your vegetables. In that same example, positive reinforcement would be if you eat your vegetables, then I will give you dessert. Punishment is also positive or negative, which means you either apply punishment, you add something, um, or you can take away something. For example, in our house, we take away video games. If something does not meet appropriate standards of behavior, then the punishment often results in a loss of privileges or toys or something else. Conditioned and unconditioned stimuli refer to whether something inherently has a rewarding value. Chocolate, peanut butter, pizza, uh, money uh, to a certain extent. Actually, money is more of a conditioned stimulus. Unconditioned stimuli, when you see them, they automatically have either a rewarding or punishing value. Conditioned stimuli, on the other hand, come to take on that value. For example, if we're talking about punishment, you show a belt to you know, a lot of people, and they say that's a belt. But there are some people who've been whooped by a belt who will suddenly become very agitated because the belt means punishment to them. And that's a conditioned stimuli. Children can be molded by controlling the stimulus response associations. All of us had a parent who had a look. My children call mine crisis face. That is the stimulus. When they see crisis face, their response is to straighten up. So children can be molded by controlling their environment and certain stimuli can come to elicit certain behavior. Watson and Skinner believed that learning could be broken down into smaller tasks and that offering immediate rewards for accomplishments would stimulate further learning. So they developed something called schedules of reinforcement. And these mean that you can have a variable ratio or a fixed ratio so you get a reward either every single time you do something or every third time you do something. That's a fixed ratio. So you know that, for example, at work, every 14th day you go to work, or every 14th day, every two weeks, you're going to get a paycheck. That is a fixed ratio. You know that for a certain amount of time, you're going to get paid. You can also call that a fixed interval. It's a certain amount of time. 
variable ratio means that the rewards are not predictable. You may have to show up one day and you get a paycheck. Then you may have to go five more days and then you get a paycheck. A lot of times this is how commission-based sales produces such um, driven salesmen because they're on a variable ratio schedule of re reinforcement so they never know when they're going to actually get paid so they work really hard all the time in order to try to reach that reward. Behavior strain means there's not enough of a reward, it's just not worth the effort to do something. In the young children we'll often see this when we provide the reward too late. For example, making a four-year-old wait until Friday to get his reward. That's not enough. Now you can condition stimuli and so a certain color of star that he gets at the end of every day gets him verbal praise, it gets him visual accomplishment, and then if he has five red stars at the end of the week, then maybe he gets a prize. So you can drag it out that way, but there has to be some sort of incremental reward in there in order to keep the child engaged. Making a child wait a whole week without any reinforcement is too difficult. Extinction burst means the child has reached that point of behavior strain, so they're going to start increasing the behavior, whatever it is, in order to try to get that reward. Now the best example is to think of children in the grocery store when they want a piece of candy. And mom says no. So they ask a little bit louder. Can I have a piece of candy? I really want that piece of candy. Mom says no. So they start begging and whining. But please, can I please, please? No. So when begging and whining doesn't work, guess what? We get a lot louder. We start throwing a temper tantrum. This is an extinction burst. Eventually, it'll reach the point where the effort to get the reward has exceeded the reward itself, and you're just like, it's not worth the effort. You have to go through an extinction burst when you're trying to eliminate a lot of behavior, so prepare for it. Shaping. Shaping is rewarding successive approximations. So if you want your child to clean his room, you need to tell him specifically what cleaning the room means. But then you need to go back and for every time he gets close, provide a reward. And then once he regularly gets close, tell him, well, you know, I've been letting you slide a little bit, for, but from now on, in order to get your red star, you need to make sure that these other things are done as well. Once he does that consistently, you raise the bar a little bit higher. In order to get the reward, you have to also do all these other things and vacuum and dust. So shaping is a gradual process of helping people form their behaviors. Then along came social learning theory, who Albert Bandura tended to say that children learn by observation and imitation. He believed that we learn by what we saw, and if we saw somebody do something and get a reward, we were more likely to do it. If we saw somebody do something and get punished, we were more likely to not do it. So there's a certain amount of behaviorism in there, but there's also a lot of that non-observable cognitive stuff in this theory. Bandura believed that children gradually become more selective in what they imitate. Biological theories believe that heredity and innate biological process govern growth. The maturationists Stanley Hall and Arnold Giselle believe that there's a predetermined biological timetable. They were proponents of a normative approach to child study, using age-related averages of children's growth and behaviors to define what is normal. Now, any of us who've worked with children can see where there might be some challenges in this because a child who grows up having tutors and nannies and lessons and 
everything they could possibly want or need in order to stimulate the environment is probably going to be at a different level of development in certain ways than a child who grows up with virtually nothing. So while there is a predetermined biological timetable for what children can actually process and comprehend, there's a wide variation in what, quote, normal is based on how rich the youth's environment is. Ethology explains that behavior is determined by a species' need for survival. It has its roots in Charles Darwin's research and describes a critical period or sensitive period for learning. This is really not a dominant theory right now. There are certain aspects of it that we think about now, um, especially when we're talking about helping children learn to read, write, those sorts of things. There are certain critical periods, it seems, but as an overall determining theory of child development, it hasn't taken off as one that is um, useful. Attachment theory is another one. Uh, Bowlby applied ethological principles to his theory of attachment, and he said that attachment between an infant and her caregiver can ensure the infant's survival. Well, this is true, but we can also look back at some other issues that are going on and trust versus mistrust, if you want to go back to Erickson. If the youth is attached to their caregiver, attachment being this understanding, this communication, then that trust, mistrust thing is going to be resolved and the child will learn to trust. If they are not attached, if the caregiver is not able to bond with, really understand, or desire to understand the infant, then the infant is probably not going to survive as well because they will have a harder time getting their needs met in most situations. Cognitive theories describe how children learn. They started out with one of the most famous of Jean Piaget. He believes that children construct their understanding of the world through their active involvement and interactions. He studied children to understand not what they knew, but how they knew it and describe children's understanding as their schemas and how they use assimilation and accommodation. This means when they run into something that they don't know, do they assimilate it? Do they change kind of what they're learning to fit what they already know to make it make sense? Or do they change what they know in order to fit this new knowledge and kind of change the way they think about the world? Piaget's cognitive development stages were the sensory motor, ages birth to two. Think back to Freud and Erickson, birth to two. Uh, Pre-operational, Piaget went up to seven instead of the two to six that we normally see. It's ages two to seven. Concrete operations begin about age seven years old, where the child uses logical operations or principles when solving problems. And after about age 12, the child can use logical operations in a systemic fashion and is starting to be able to use abstractions. This is why it's often challenging for children to do things that are abstract, to work with algebra when they are too young because that whole concept of a letter representing a number, and it gets very fuzzy. It gets fuzzy for a lot of grown-ups, I know, but definitely fuzzy for younger children. Vygotsky proposed the sociocultural theory. He agreed that children are active learners, but their knowledge is socially constructed. That means they actively learn what's going on and observe and repeat or not, but what they learn is impacted by what's rewarded in society. Cultural values and customs dictate what's important to learn, and children learn more from expert members of the society. Now, depending on the child, you also have to look at what they consider an expert. Is it a pastor? Is it a TV person like Hannah Montana? 
or is it a teacher? Uh, there's a variety of people that our society will sort of communicate to the youth are experts. Information processing theories use the model of the computer to describe how the brain works. It focuses on how information is perceived, stored in memory, and how memories are retrieved and then used to solve problems. One of the things that's come from information processing theory is really strengthening neural connections. So there are multiple ways to access information, visual, auditory, smell, kinesthetic. It's kind of like saving a file and putting shortcuts in multiple places on your computer. The systems theory believes that development can't be explained by a single concept, but rather a complex system. Gary Broffenbrenner proposed the ecological systems theory. He believed that the varied systems in the environment and the interrelationship among the systems shape a child's development. Both the environment and biology influence a child's development. And the environment affects the child, and the child influences the environment. This last piece is one of the very unique pieces that Broffenbrenner suggested, that children are not passive in their environment. They interact in the environment. They act a certain way. The environment changes, for better or for worse. So a child's environment does not exist in spite of the child. And we have to remember that with that, the environment may be a stressful environment, may be a domestically violent household, may be mom's depressed, whatever. Something's wrong in the household, which affects the child. So the child, in turn, tends to act out in order to try to get his or her needs met, to try to distract from what's going on. There's a lot of reasons we can look at why the child acts out. That acting out increases the negativity in the environment. So you've got this negative spiral going on. If you impact one area or the other, the family or the child, then there's a good chance that a reciprocal interaction will occur. So if you can help improve the child's behavior, the stress may lessen in the family or vice versa. Help the family and the child may start acting better. This is a detailed explanation of Broffenbrenner's ecological model. But basically it shows you how there's a lot of different things that can interact in order to influence a child's development, value systems, and mental, physical, and cognitive health. In summary, there are a variety of theories to explain the behavior and child development. Each theory makes a unique contribution to our understanding of human development. We understand now that behavior and cognition is partially age-dependent. The immediate and extended environment and interactions therein shape what is perceived and how it is perceived. And behaviors are motivated by rewards of pleasure and or survival, or avoiding punishment or extinction.